Hi everyone. Sorry for being late. Um, so today, the costume might take a little bit of an explanation. Um, I am dressed as Dolly Wilde from How to Build a Girl. Catelyn Moran's novel that I absolutely love. And there's a movie coming out starring Beanie Feldstein um, on May 8th. I am counting down the days. So, I have donned my, my best Dolly Wilde impression. Um, as you will see. Did the book cover. Hey, <laughs> look at that. Okay, uh, and now I'm going to... I stuffed myself into fishnets and those boots for someone had to see them. Okay. So, um, the character is named Johanna Morgan, who um, turns herself into Dolly Wilde. Um, so this is the bit where um, she starts finding the character. Um, if you... I'm gonna say a little content warning for like the first 10 seconds um, for suicide. Um, just stick your fingers in your ears and go la 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 for about 10 seconds and then you'll be fine. Join us then. I'm thrilled by the idea of killing myself. It seems like such a gratifyingly noble thing to do. A monster has come to town, me, and there's only one hero who can kill it, me. I'm not actually going to kill myself, of course. For starters, I suspect I might put up a struggle and fight dirty, perhaps biting. And secondly, I don't actually want to die. I don't want there to be a dead body on the bed and it to be the end of everything. I don't want to not live. I just want to not be me anymore. Everything I am now is not working. I basically want to live the easy like Sunday morning bank advert, a huge warehouse flat in London in which I am wearing a fluffy toweling robe and reading the paper. And then later, I will be going out in a beautiful green dress and saying something so funny, someone has to have sex with me. That's what I want. That's my future life. Lying under the bed, I consider the chances of this scenario happening. To current Johanna Morgan. They are blindingly small. I just don't have the resources. I'm gonna need a bigger boat, I think. And so I just start all over again. I've read many times the phrase, a self-made man, but misunderstood what it meant. I presumed it was describing not a working class boy made good in industry, smoking a cigar in slightly overshined shoes, but something more elemental and fabulous instead. Someone mage-like who had stitched themselves together out of silver gauze and ambition and magic. A self-made man, not a woman, not of woman born but alchemized, through sheer force of will by the man himself. This is what I want to be. I want to be a self-made woman. I want to conjure myself out of every sparkling, fast-moving thing I can see. I want to be the creator of me. I'm gonna begat myself. The first thing I'm burning is my name. Johanna Morrigan does not have good associations anymore. Johanna Morrigan is the answer to the local question, who do you think is fucked up recently? I compile a list of possible new names and take it to Chrissy. He is on his bed knitting himself a bobble hat whilst listening to an Agatha Christie audio tape from the library. A big pale boy hunched over a tiny pair of needles. Chrissy becomes very angry when you tell him that knitting is for girls. Knitting was primarily a male hobby at its inception, he says, big pale hands clacking the needles. You'd anger a lot of Scottish fishermen if you told them it was a girl's habit. They'd beat you with a giant salted cod, Joanna, and I'd pay to watch. I turn the audio tape off just as Poirot has a tisane. Poirot isn't going to find it difficult to work out who killed you, Chrissy says, pretending to stab me through the heart with the knitting needle and turning the tape back on again. I turn it back off again. Chrissy, I'm getting a new name. What do you think would be good? Hamburglar. Now fuck off. Seriously, Kay. Chrissy knows how low I am. 
Two days ago, he found me lying face down and crying into a sanitary towel, which I had positioned under my eyes by way of acknowledging the sheer volumes of sorrow. He did laugh at this. He, sorry, he did laugh at this, but also looked sympathetic. I still think Hamburglar, he says, and it's quieter, like he's listening. I've tried to choose a name that's thin and light and wonderful, like an aluminum glider. I'm going to climb into, onto this name, wait for a thermal, and then fly it all the way down to London to my future. But it's got to work in print. It must suit black ink, but it also needs to sound cheerful when shouted across a bar. It must sound like a joyful yell. The list of names I make are evidence alone of why, on the whole, it is best for girls not to become mothers in their teens. For whilst teenage girls are more than capable of raising a child perfectly well, the kind of name a teenage girl is apt to choose is poor. How about Juno Jones, I ask. Briskly, they'll call you Jumbo Bones. Eleanor Volpine? A look. Kitten Lithium? Is this actually for a human being? You're not getting Iggy Pop to name the new Blue Peter Cat or something, are you? Yes, it's for me. How about Laurel Canyon? It's where, like, Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Young lived in the 60s. The hippie Valhalla. I could be Laurel Canyon. I hate Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. I think they're... There's a word I'm not going to say on uh, the Porter Square uh, Instagram. I blink. Blimey. Chrissy smiles. Not really. But his eyes are cold. My favorite two are Bell Jar and Dolly Wilde. Bell Jar, like in the Bell Jar, you know, Sylvia Plath, and Dolly Wilde, who is Oscar Wilde's niece. She was like this amazing alcoholic lesbian who was dead scandalous and died really young. Chrissy looks at me. And these are the names you've chosen to lead a happier, Better life? Chrissy, seriously, which one do you like best? You can't just be Johanna Morrigan, he asks. I can't just be Johanna Morrigan, I say. I can't. Chrissy sighs. Ip dip do, the dog's got the flu, the cat's got the chicken pox, so out goes you. An hour and a half later, I'm in the big chemists in Queens Square, shoplifting black rimmel eyeliner into my coat pocket with an immense sense of destiny. I feel happy for the first time since I left Violet's house. It's morally okay to steal this eyeliner because I need it. I need it to draw Dolly Wilde's face onto my own. I love Dolly Wilde. She's my new pet. She's an early 1990s prototype Tamagotchi. I am my own imaginary friend. In many ways, it's the best and healthiest hobby I could have discovered right now. Me. I am going to make take my rundown shell and upgrade myself. On the wall above my bed, I start blue tacking up things I think will be useful in this task. A collection of attributes I would wish to gift myself, now that I'm starting again. It will be like those scenes in detective shows where they pin up all the clues on the wall and then stare at it while music wells until suddenly... They know who the murderer is and grab their coat and run out of the room. I'm going to put every clue I have about how to be a better me on this wall and I will stare at it whilst listening to the best of the Hollies until suddenly I will know who I am, grab my coat and run out of the room to have sex. I cut the pictures out of the Radio Times and from books and magazines and, jum um, magazines and jumble sales. The women, Barbara Streisand and Hello Dolly, Anne of Green Gables, and Miranda Richardson as Queen Elizabeth in Blackadder, a triumvirate of impressible gingers. Irrepressible gingers. That makes more sense. Then the brunettes. Dolly Park Parker in her furs, Kate Bush in her nighty, Elizabeth Taylor in her excelsis. I appear to have no time for blondes, except for Bugs Bunny dressed up as a woman as he seduces the fool fud. This is a woman I could be, definitely, a cartoon man rabbit dressed up as a girl trying to have sex with a stuttering bald man. I could definitely do that. I assemble the men on my wall, my imaginary coterie of brother lovers. Dylan Thomas smoking a fag, the young Orson Welles pranking the world with the war of the worlds and not giving a shit. George Orwell, so noble, so clever, so dead so young. Tony Benn inventing stamps and the post office tower. 
Rick Myall as Lord Flashheart and Blackadder, kicking the door in and shouting, Woof! A picture of Lennon when he was very young. I don't know exactly what he went on to do, but I do know what he that he looks hot here. All brown eyes, natty scarf, and floppy hair. No one this handsome could be that bad, surely. And the words, the rest of the wall is just words. A page from On the Road about the burning Roman candles. Scarlett O'Hara's with God is my witness, I will never go hungry again speech, which I stare at thoughtfully whilst eating cheese sandwiches. The lyrics to Rebel Rebel and Queen Bitch. When Bowie yelps that he could do better than that, I hear another young person stuck somewhere, looking out the window and imagining how much better they could invent the world if they were just given the chance to lay their hands on the machinery. If they could just bust into the engine room at 24 hours with a toolbox. Excuse me. Some of it I write directly in, onto the paintwork, so it will never be lost or blown away. I am collaging myself here on my wall. And as I assemble the inside of my head like a new hangout, so I alter my appearance too. At jumble sales, I skew my typical purchases, stuff that my parents would have described as vibey. As with most hippies, they love bright colors. A chunky hand-knitted jumper with rainbows would be greeted with, you'll look fucking natty in that, son. But I am going to be wearing this stuff no more. No more color. I'm in black now. Black. For business. Like an evil highwayman. Boots. Tights. Shorts. Blouse. All in black, with a black-tailed waiter's jacket that's slightly too tight over my tits, but no matter. I am Madame Ant. I'm planning to hold up some passing stage coaches, heading toward London, and steal a new life from whoever's inside. I dye my hair black, too, with shoplifted Movita. Security in the chemist appears to be appears to consist of the sign, shoplifters will be prosecuted, on the door. Winningly, someone has amended it by scribbling out letters with a black felt, uh, with a black felt tip, tip pen. <laughs> I don't know why that was so hard. Uh, to read, hope, be cute, which I am now adapting as my new motto. You can nick anything from the chemists, like bright red lipstick, too, which I am splashing on like there's no tomorrow. When school starts again in September, the reveal of my new black hair gets several comments. The best one, from Emma Paget, Ah, wicked! You look like dead... You look dead like Winona Ryder. The worst, from Craig Miller, who's still standing, who's standing behind her, you look like a dead Winona Ryder, more like. Ha ha. I am unperturbed by his comments. Craig Miller is a boy who makes girls he fancies smell farts that he does on his hand. He is not Giacomo Casanova. In parentheses, history of my life, Longman's, 1967 to 72. Who I know would fancy me, as he loves clever women. And also big arses. A month after Midland's weekend, I am coming downstairs to do my post-monitoring shift by the front door, dressed like Edward Scissorhands, moonlighting as a waiter. I spend the hours embroidering embroidering my name, Dolly Wilde, onto all my clothes, across the breast of my jacket, on the turn-up of my shorts, across my thigh. I am branding me. I do not want to forget my name. Making Dolly Wilde is my business now. I enjoy the feeling that deciding who I am is work. I now have a career, an only person in our house to do so. I find my anxiety levels have dropped enormously. On this particular Tuesday, today's project, I have decided is networking. I'm being very serious about the business of me. In Business Bible, The Practice of Management, the advice is that you should find other people in the same line of work and make contact. Cousin Allie has recently reinvented herself, viz going goth last year. So I'm going uptown to network with her. And I'm taking my business associate with me. What do you want? I blink. I'm standing at the man on his ass statue with my cousin Allie and her gang of four goth boys, one of which I recognize from school. I'm pretty sure he's the only kid in Wolverhampton called Oliver. I remember him before he was a goth. Every day in the dinner hall, kids would stand around him in the queue saying, Please, sir, I want some more, in wavering voices and then pushing him into a wall. Really, with those kinds of stats, it was just a matter of time before he went goth. I say, hola, in my most cheerful way, but it doesn't seem to be working. You want something? Allie says again. I shift awkwardly. I'm pretty sure I've read this correctly. 
that this is the outpost for loners, that culturally this is what I should be filed under, goths sitting by statue slash war memorial. People with no upper body strength who read poetry. These are my people. I am wearing my black waiter's jacket, black boots, black tights, and so much eyeliner that I look like a puffin. Given this effort, I thought the counterculture would just let you in. I didn't know there was an interview process. I blink again. I'm your cousin, Johanna, Pat's kid. Allie looks up for a minute, a hard evaluating look. You look like fat Nana, she says eventually. I got her bed. Allie's lips thin. I got the budgie cage. Gonna put a hamster in it. Silence. Ten feet away, my business associate, Lupin, is chasing a pigeon. I've dressed him up brilliantly, he's currently obsessed with tigers, and I've made him some tiger ears and a tiger tail, which has pinned the back of his trousers. He's chasing the pigeon whilst shouting, "Rar!" at it. A boy looks up. Allie, is she with you? Allie shrugs. I shrug too. The boy shrugs back. I shrug again. Fucking hell, what is this what being a teenager consists of? No offense, but I've had livelier days potty trading Lupin during the phase when he used to poo behind the sofa and then throw it into the potty and ask for a reward. Actually, that really was quite fun. I'm sorry, I'm a child. Poop jokes are never not funny. You a goth, then? The boy is talking. He's looking at my outfit, which is all black. Well, is being a goth really a straightforward binary, black, or white issue? I ask in the manner of an elderly professor on the BBC, gesturing to their white faces and black clothes. Nothing. Man, I have seen clips of Gilda Radner tearing up Saturday Night Live with this kind of shit. I don't think anyone in this town is ever going to laugh at my jokes. They just don't get semantic deconstruction here. Maybe I will have to move to New York. I'd say I'm goth curious? Still nothing. What bands you into? The boy is talking again. Allie is utterly limp, letting him quiz me. I think for a minute. Well, Beatles, obviously. Zeppelin. The best of Simon and Garfunkel. All that. I think. Shit. The boy is staring at me. Clearly this isn't impressing him. Don't you like anything recent? He asks eventually. Of course, I say. Roachford, Dire Straits, Michael Jackson, even though he seems like a bit of a prat. I also like Tina Turner. I've worked out a whole dance routine to steamy windows using a broom in lieu of a cane, but I'm not telling him that. He's staring at me like this conversation is a game I'm losing badly. But mainly John Coltrane and Charlie Mingus, I put in quickly. All the hot, bad jazzers. I'm lying. I hate jazz. I think it sounds like people being completely mad. But my dad plays it a lot, and I recall his sage advice. Whenever you need to win in a situation, talk about jazz, Johanna. It confuses people. The boy continues to stare. Allie moves slightly away from me. I wait for a minute, but it seems like this conversation is over. Well, I say... I can't believe Jazz has failed me. I wonder what else my dad is wrong about. Well, just gonna... I stand up. Lupin is 20 feet away in pursuit of a hobbling pigeon that has only one foot. Just off now. Allie barely nods. The boy completely ignores me. This initial meeting with Wolverhampton's counterculture has gone badly. A proper zero out of 10. I have failed on preparation. I am going to need a much bigger boat. This is my recurrent problem. I look across the square to the record locker, Wolverhampton's independent record shop. I make a decision. Come, Lupin, I say, standing up and holding out my hand to him. We must away to pastures new. This was the traditional parting line of New Yorker critic Alexander Woolcott, traditionally uttered after some disaster, such as drunken collapse or massive social faux pas. Lupin takes my hand, still trying to kick the pigeon, and I walk across to the store. I wish these guys knew about Alexander Woolcott. They would respect me, even as I walked away. Instead, I can just hear them laughing. Allie. Oh my god. I am about to do what is undoubtedly the bravest thing I have ever done. Record shops 
are not for women folk. This is a known fact. They are the gang treehouse with no girls allowed written on the side. The young music loving person's equivalent of the gentleman's smoking room. In my most paranoid fantasy, when I open the door, all the music will stop and everyone will look up like in a Wild West saloon bar when the stranger walks in. When I open the door, the music does actually stop and everyone looks up. The music stopping is just a coincidence. It's the end of the record. But everyone looking up isn't. The people here, hunched over the racks, are boys in army surplus jackets and Doc Martens with long hair. A couple have tatty black leather jackets on. There's a pair of Madchester flares by the seven inches. They are all well-qualified members of the counterculture. They are allowed to be here. By way of contrast, I'm a fat girl in a black waiter's jacket and a blouse holding hands with a ginger six-year-old wearing tiger ears and a tiger tail who is looking at a perambulating pigeon and shouting, the eagle is coming, very loudly. Side two of bummed starts and they all look away again. A couple are smirking, I don't care. I have regular fulfilling sex with a hairbrush and I am the bastard son of a bastard son of Brendan Bayan. They will all rue the day, eventually. All right, the man behind the counter says. He has greasy black hair and is wearing a Sepultra t-shirt, which I can tell merely from the logo is an internationally recognized sign that he kills and eats women. Just browsing, I say cheerfully and walk over to the first rack of records, looking purposeful. It's the M's. I look at the record sleeves in what I hope is a knowledgeable way and try to work out what bands I would like, judging by their cover art. Morrissey, Viva Hate, Big Gloomy, Big Mega Four, Piercings, In the Nose. That would hurt. I wonder if, when you blow your nose, bits emerge from the hole. Can confirm they don't. Lupin picks up a Van Morrison record, when, then fumbles it and drops it. Are you looking for something in particular? The man behind the counter asks, shirtily. A couple of boys look up again. Shall I try jazz again? Escalator Over the Hill by Carla Bley, I say. This is my dad's worst record by a long chalk, an experimental double album of freeform jazz opera that clears the front room every time he puts it on. Even he can't listen to it for more than half an hour without making moaning noises, like he's in pain. He moves. It's pretty obscure, though, so you probably don't have it, I say, pityingly. Confuse them with jazz. It's jazz, I clarify, helpfully. Johnny hates jazz, the man says loudly. No, we haven't got any Johnny hates jazz. Uh, no, I say, slightly panicked. Not Johnny hates jazz. Even I know Johnny hates jazz or shit. Girls with perms like them. Walking in this shop and asking for Johnny hates jazz is basically a death sentence. But it's too late. The boys are giggling now. No, not Johnny Hates Jazz. Carla Bley, I try again, desperately. It's, it's a jazz opera. Oh, fuck it. Look, I'll try somewhere else. I prepare to sweep out of the shop, but Lupin's holding a magazine. Hardly, I try to wrestle it out of his hands. The paper tears. I look up, stricken. If he's going to charge me for the magazine, I have no money. I'll have to be killed and eaten by him in his back room repeatedly until I've paid it off. It's free, the man says, gesturing us out of the shop with his hand. It's free. It, it's a free magazine. Take it. Take it. Come, Lupin, I say, opening the door with as much dignity as I can muster. Let's go and see Alexander Woolcott. He's waiting. The boy by the rack nearest the door bends over and hands me something. Your son's tail, he says, handing me Lupin's tiger tail. Again, with the son thing. Jesus, he's not my son. I am actually a virgin, actually. Though, although I obviously don't say this. On the bus home, Lupin lulls against the window in some kind of daze, and I take the sticky, torn magazine from his hands and flick through it. It's a free musician's monthly magazine called Making Music. The cover promises to take the eager reader through the entire backline rig of Delamitri's current tour, reveal the Mike secrets of Midge Yore, and show us around the LA studio of legendary session bassist Pino Palladino. I've essentially found the contents of my dad's head printed out. Even though I'll read anything, you can quiz me on the ingredients in Bird's Strawberry Trifle if all you like. I've read that jacket. Even I can't read this. 
But on page four, there's a column called J. Arthur Rank, which prints the utter nonsense them magazine people write. Angry musician letters send, angry musician readers send in lines from the music press, which they find vexingly pretentious. Craig Amet, reviewing the touch in Melody Maker, claims, this is the sound of God exploding, slowly, and the debris hitting Dali in the face. Ian Wilkinson, in Disc and Music Echo, meanwhile, is denigrated for lauding Sore Throat's LP as an overnight evolution from in-joking musical amoebas to mighty sonic dolphins. And David Stubbs, again in Melody Maker, describes prog rock band Henry Cow's sound as dragging a moose around on stage and sucking on it. Nobble these nerds, the J. Arthur Rank column urges. Go to work on the bozos behind the typewriters. This is, apparently, terrible writing. The music press is, obviously, some manner of Versailles, filled with decadent, lace-cuffed dandies, typing grandiloquent nonsense without hard music about hard-working musicians and bands. These are puffed-up fop parasites riding on the mighty back of the noble rock beast. Lollygaggers, poseurs, petit maître, riffing, tossed late into the night, making no sense, making the world an infinitely worse place. These people are, really, no better than scum. And I think, I love this stuff. I could do this. Fuck writing a book about a fat girl and a dragon. It could be, I could be a music journalist instead. I could easily write this stuff. It would be a doddle. This is better than poems about my dog. This is what I've been waiting for. This is my way out. So that's that for this evening. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, read this book. See the movie when it comes out.